daybreak in Hong Kong. This city of more than 7 million is slow to wake, but there are signs that it's beginning to stir. As the sun struggles to rise from behind the mountains and signal the start of the day, finally, the city bursts open and it's off and running. I start my day worlds away, or above really, taking in the final precious moments of peace. Hong Kong is a place that demands both energy and attention, and I'm ready for everything it's got to offer. I'm James Williams, and this is Hong Kong in 24 Hours. Perched above Hong Kong's harbour, the view at the Intercontinental's presidential suite is a privileged one. The 650 square metre, more than $12,000 a night space, has housed countless celebrities. And it's now proving to be a serene backdrop for a morning martial arts lesson. The breathing system and also the circulation of the breath. And now we start with this, cross hand, lift it up. Take it back. My Sifu, or master for the morning, is Sam Lau, who learned this style known as Wing Chun under Bruce Lee's very own master, Yip Man. Hong Kong is so important to the world for Wing Chun and for martial arts. We start develop Wing Chun in 1950, continuously, and Western people like it. Tai Chi is especially for the health, but Wing Chun is both side, health and defense. After the warm up, Master Lau decides to pick up the pace, emphasizing the essential techniques. You lose your balance. Yeah. And we use the center line. Mm -hmm. Center line, you hold your fist. Bang. Now we pull tag and hit at the same time. Mm -hmm. But if I want to hit you again, yeah. bang, 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 bang. Another hook, bang, another hook. Ah, ah. If no hook, bang, bang, just like that. Yeah. I kick and punch. Wing Chun is that simple. At 68 years old, Master Lau is the only proof you need that Wing Chun will keep you alive and kicking. My next destination is central the neighbourhood at the heart of Hong Kong Island where consumerism and capitalism meet. Towering bank buildings shade the sidewalks, full of business people scurrying past the latest luxury brands. It's known as an international shopping destination and custom suits are always on my list when coming here. These days, the market seems to be flooded with quick turnaround bargain deals, a departure from Hong Kong's more refined tailoring history. But if you know where to look, there's still a few families that are using the traditional techniques and can give London's Savile Row a run for their money. Since 1953, Ascot Chang has been bringing bespoke luxury to Hong Kong. Originally a shirt tailor, the company has gracefully moved into full suiting and has managed to keep it a homegrown family business all the while. Today, Ascot Chang has expanded around the world and has dressed high in clients, including two US presidents. Helping me with my fitting is Justin Chang, a third generation Chang. So I want to go for something slightly more traditional. Yeah. Uh, skinny, yeah. fitted, uh, formal, but relatively laid back. I'm sure. With more than 2,000 different fabrics and countless cuts, my options are limitless. I just wonder whether a check like that, when you see it 
in a, in a full suit, whether it's a little overpowering, whether it looks it a can bit too be, much. It can be, um, especially if you're on camera, for example, then I would suggest either something that's really subtle with the checks or... So a more simple just, pattern. We'll just go with the solids. I do like this one, I have to say. That one's a little bit too dark. Yes. But this is probably just about perfect. All right. Ascot Chang's reputation wasn't just built on its fine fabrics. It had to be something more. At the heart of it, what makes for a great suit? On top of the fabric is the tailoring. So um, for us, the type of suit that we make, uh, we do it in the traditional Shanghainese style, which more handwork done in the suit. In between the fabrics of the suit, there's what we call the canvas, and that's what gives the, the suit its structure. And uh, we, we pad stitch it by hand. Complemented with a slightly more daring purple lining and a classic mahogany button, now it's on to the fitting. Now we're not on a normal timeline. Ascot Chang is doing this accelerated fitting, especially for me. The shoulder's very key. For an average customer, expect it to take two to three weeks, including two fittings and a minimum cost of $1,800 for a two-piece suit. How do I look? Looking good, but let's take a look. There's a bit of extra fabric here in terms of the length. We need to get Justin the and their head tailor inspect me from head to toe. What we tried to achieve is a slim fit without the pulling along, uh, along the waist. So we want a clean fit. So you think we're good with this? I think right now we're, we're looking pretty good. I think perfect. All right. Just to make sure everything is truly perfect, I get the sign off from the company's managing director and the son of Ascot Chang. Tony it's Chang. Great. It's fantastic. Well, I mean, what do you think? How does this fit for you? It's definitely it's a very fitted suit. It's like a <laughs> gloves to your are you body. Are you trying to tell me it's too, too fitted for <laughs> no, no, this, we, we do the suits according to the, the customer's preference. Mm -hmm. Now, if this is the way you like it, and we, I can see that this is the, the, the current style. And after the suit is made, this is what you like. And in just a couple of weeks, this will be delivered directly to my door. In a city with more than 50 Michelin star restaurants, many of Hong Kong's gourmet meals have humble beginnings. It's incredible on what a small scale some of these fishermen are operating yes, on. Like yes. Really small boats and almost looks like a family operation. It, it is. I start my afternoon on the south side of the island in Atlay Chow, where Chef David Lai of the newly opened restaurant Fish School is showing me what Catch of the Day really means. Hong Kong started as a fishing village, so so this is very much still part of it, and of course it's on a much smaller scale now. So okay, so what would you choose? Well, I mean, what do you cook with in your restaurant? What are your what are your favorites? Here, we're hand-picking what Chef Lai will serve up for a special good. lunch. They are actually quite uh, similar to uh, Dover sole, right. and in texture and in, in flavor. Oh, I love Dover sole. Yeah. <laughs> and these crabs are very good. They're, they're very small, but they're very good for making soups. Those are uh, red prawn now. Those are very seasonal. This is the best quality stuff you can find here. Exactly. I mean, it depends on the day. Sometimes, you know, the, the with these markets, very seasonal. If there's a, a typhoon, if there's this like a very windy, you get less less fish. But this is the beauty of it. So it truly reflects what is seasonal and what is local. Now off to more scenic waters. The name Hong Kong literally means fragrant harbour and the harbour itself is the lifeblood of the city and as every local knows there's only one way to see the real Hong Kong by boat. And what a boat it is. The 24 metre new marine is one of the luxury yachts in the Riviera Orientales fleet and we have it all to ourselves.
So much of Hong Kong is based around this little area, isn't it? I mean, whether it's the economic side from, from food or transportation or the social life of people wanting to go out and live and party yes. out on the water. It's, 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 you know, this city lives and breathes this world. Yes, it, it, it's very much, uh, it's very much part of it. I mean, as you said, the, the land is, the land mass is so small. I think it's liberating because, you know, in, a, in, in, in the city, it's small, you know, everybody have the same routine, go to, go to work, where they live, the, the apartments are small, and, and it's going out on a sunny day, you know, you have the big expanse. So I, I think that that's very liberating. My final destination is Sai Kung in the Northern Territories. It's where some of the most envious views of Hong Kong are hidden and offer us a pause from the big city life. So I might be being a little bit cheeky, but while Chef finishes preparing lunch, I have to jump off the boat because I have an adventure up the mountain. Despite being one of the densest cities in the world, Parks and nature reserves make up 40% of Hong Kong. And Johnny Singh from XFly is eager to take me 400 metres high to the ultimate vantage point. And you want me to jump off this cliff? Yes. Really? Yes. I'm not convinced this is the best of ideas, really. You have 5, 10 to 20 minutes along here. And land on the beach? And land in the beach. Okay, let's go. This connect you and me. Yep. So I'm out the front, you're out the back. Yeah, so, so don't fall out, huh? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. so first step, you have to one. Yeah. One, 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 until with the sky. Yeah, try your one as much as you can. Yeah, don't jump, uh, just one. Just yeah. run. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Running. And we're flying. <laughs> this is amazing! Woo! It's actually incredibly peaceful, isn't it? Landing. That was absolutely incredible. Just in time for lunch. Your masterpiece. Look at this. This is like a local version of a boya base. Mm -hmm. I think mean, a dish like this is typical in all uh, cultures where you have fishermen. As a, traditionally, they would have leftovers and they were they have stuff that they cannot sell, maybe the fish are too small. It's usually very simple, one pot dish. You know, of course it's a deluxe version. You know, we, 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 it's we, not just the cheap little bits of fish. No, no, we, we went all out. Why are you so passionate about Hong Kong seafood? Because obviously you've just opened a whole new restaurant that's dedicated just to it. What, what is it that you love about it? Yes, uh, this, uh, this would be something that we would serve at the uh, fish schools. That we try to interview with the different cultures. And uh, I, I think in Hong Kong, uh, seafood is uh, very important because we don't really grow anything. We don't, we don't have cows. We don't have really significant, you know, agriculture. So this is your national dish, is it seafood? Basically in Hong Kong. And I, I think people sometimes forget that. Heading back into the main harbour, it can only be described as a cinematic scene. As the sun burns out, the city reveals itself in twilight, and we use the last minutes of the day to take in Hong Kong's indescribable beauty.
As the excitement of a night out is starting to tempt the city, I'm in TST, the pulsing, tourist-filled neighbourhood by Hong Kong's harbour. Even in a frenetic, constantly morphing city like Hong Kong, it's essential to keep hold of your history. So tonight, I'm visiting the Hong Kong Chinese Orchestra. Five musicians fill the sound of this orchestra as it flows effortlessly between the repertoires of East and West. Founded in 1977, it remains a cultural ambassador. And tonight, I'm getting a behind the scenes look at their work with conductor Chu Yi Chat. Up close, a true appreciation can be formed. These instruments have been carved and wielded from history, each equipped with an enormous range of sound and emotion. Yeah, the name is called Bass Gerho. It functions as double bass in the orchestra. Yeah, it's called Zheng. Uh, it's kind of zeta, it has uh, 20, 21 strings, yeah, 21 strings. If you, if you um, imagine playing all the strings together like harp, mm -hmm. you have kind, kind of like, a, we call it glissando, and you have very uh, it does sound like fanciful harp, sound and a very dreamlike and of, of water flowing type of, of sound if they, if they do it this way. Usually. Could, could you, could you Very <laughs> yeah. This is something very, very unique. It's such an iconic yeah. sound, isn't yeah. it? It's uh, one of the most common Chinese instruments and uh, instruments that a lot of people know about. Mm -hmm. At least they've seen it, even they haven't heard it, you know, it appears in movies and everywhere. Now, it is a Chinese orchestra, but also at the same time, it's Hong Kong based and it's slightly different. It's more international, isn't it, in terms of the people who are actually playing the instruments and also the music that you perform. Yeah, it's true. Um, it, it's like Hong Kong, you know, the place is more cosmopolitan, you know, a lot of mixed in terms of East and West. It should be an orchestra for the world and then whoever wants to use it, you can use it. night has officially fallen, the saturated glow of neon lights is luring me back to Hong Kong centre to try the perpetually popular Yardbird. Since its opening in 2011, it's been serving inventive yakitori and cocktails to an incredibly loyal crowd. And that's why its co-founder and current Hong Kong it girl, Lindsay Jang, is the perfect host. So what are people looking for? What, what is a good night out in Hong Kong? Is this old school uh, colonial Britain expat or is this new China? So you have a lot of kids who grew up in very affluent families and lifestyles that are local per se because they're all Cantonese speaking, but they've all been educated abroad. You know, so they they have this new level of what are they demanding, right? They want they want places like this. They want places that remind them of the places they hung out when they went to school in New York or Boston or LA or California or London. Yeah. And I mean look what you've done here. You basically you've come from America. You've created just about the coolest restaurant in Hong Kong. You still can't get a table here. How did you pull that off? I think the magic that we have, the balance that we've struck, what was missing in Hong Kong was this hospitality that both my partner and I got from New York. You know, like you go. There's obviously no lack of choice here, but sometimes knowing the right person can get you in the right door. 
And tonight, that's at Coco, where we're getting a lesson from sake sommelier, Raphael Holzer. And it's a complex drink as well, isn't it? It's in, in the sense like a wine. There's good, there's bad, there's old, there's young. Oh, it's super, it's super complex. There's basically six grades of sake, and that's just what we know. Most people have probably only experienced like hot sake in the US that comes from a box that's basically cooking wine. It's like <laughs> you heat it up to generally mask impurities in an alcohol that's either too harsh. Some sake can be heated, but then most people don't realize how beautiful sake can be. Let's give it a try then. Yeah. What, what have we got exactly? So we start with Hatsukame from uh, Shizuka. That's a 65% Tokubetsu Junmai. That's good. It's really light actually. There we go. That's quite a lot stronger. We're already going closer to the middle of the grain. And that already has way more, way more flavor, way more depth, right? It depends too, if we were eating, I think it would be different. <laughs> I mean, every brewery has like a very different expression of the yeah. sake. There's one bottle that Raphael can't wait to share with us. This is called uh, Sake N. It's the famous Japanese footballer Hidetoshi Nakata's venture into the sake business. One bottle will set you back around a thousand dollars. This is the first time this bottle goes on the table anywhere. This is the first time we're gonna, I'm gonna taste this side because I'm actually, I'm actually it, quite excited. It's so beautiful. That's actually delicious. Wow. This, is, <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> what does what we are doing right now tell us about Hong Kong? It tells us that so many, so many Hong Kong has shown itself to be the dynamic, heart-racing, messy, intoxicating mix that it's always been. And life here is only speeding up. And as for me, I'm just getting started too. So join me next month in Buenos Aires for another 24 hours of once-in-a-lifetime experiences.